I'm going to get started. Good afternoon, mm -hmm. everyone. I am Ashley Ferraro. I'm the Assistant Director for the Office of Global Learning at FDU. Today, we have Mr. Ram Kishan to join us. He will be discussing the topic of religion and secularism in multicultural democracies. And before we get started with Mr. Kushan's uh, lecture, I would like to give a little bit of bio about him. Mr. Ram Kushan is a visiting professor in the political science department at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and a member of the virtual global faculty at Fairleigh Dickinson University in Madison, New Jersey, before joining academia in 1994 in Massachusetts, he held senior positions in government and foreign services in India, Europe, and Africa. In his 33 years of service in government, Ram Kishan's responsibilities included internal security, diplomatic relations, trade, and economic policy. He concluded a cultural agreement between India and Italy, promoted defense and economic cooperation between governments of India and Republic of Seychelles and supervised natural elections in the state of Haryana, India. Mr. Kishan was also chairman of public sector cooperation in charge of environmental protection, land development and forestation in the state of Rajasthan, India. He has taught at Clark University, Worcester State, Algothrop University, Fairleigh Dickinson University, and Oakland University. His field of specialization includes politics of South, A South Asia, Central Asia, China, comparative politics, cross-cultural perspectives, international relations, and globalization. Ram is also a keen practitioner of yoga and a student of Indian philosophy. He is also fluent in Hindi, Urdu and Italian. So today I'd like to now introduce Mr. Ram Kishan and he will take over his, for his virtual lecture. After his lecture is complete, um, there will be about 10 minutes for a Q&A session. And during that time, I ask you if you can please use the chat feature on the side to ask your questions. And I will take turns in listed order um, to make sure that we get your questions answered. And please, I ask um, to you to also keep all your cameras and um, computers muted. This video event is being recorded and that will be shared once the event is complete. The link will be shared with all um, for you to have. So now I would like to please introduce um, Mr. Ramkishan to begin his discussion. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for a nice introduction. And uh, as you know, the subject is uh, sec religion and secularism in multicultural democracy. And uh, so what I will do is first to define what is religion, then secularism, and what secularism involves in terms of non-establishment of religion, state religion relationships, and uh, the activities of both secularists and religionists to advance their respective uh, positions in the state and the society. And uh, also give a brief history of the process of secularization as it started in the uh, medieval times. So um, actually secularization uh, uh, started in the 16th century after uh, the reformation and also uh, the fact that Pope Gregory the 16th had uh, given an encyclical saying that the Pope's authority is infallible and that his power is enormous and uh, 
and therefore and also that the secular authority is subordinate to the spiritual authority uh, that is uh, the concept of a spiritually hierarchical world in which the emperor like lay subjects of the emperor was supposedly subject to the authority of the pope uh, now this led to the uh, constitution of a autonomous legally self existing church but also had the unintended consequence of a uh, self constituting secular civil authority or a sovereign state uh, the uh, treaty of ofsgar in 1555 Uh, decided that the king will decide the religion of the subjects of his or her kingdom and um, uh, therefore there was a religious homogenization uh, because the uh, political authority or the king was asked to punish heretics and to expel or eliminate uh, heretics from the state and all the religious uh, authorities that is the catholics uh, the lutherans and the orthodox agreed on the need for a sovereign authority uh, which will maintain public order and uh, unity of the uh, state and unity between the uh, subjects uh, the government and the national territory and uh, so what happened really was that political order which was supposed to depend on the pre existing religious or spiritual authority was substituted the theological judgment was substituted by a political judgment about the unity and the uh, all the religious leaders agreed uh, for three reasons one they thought that this will strengthen national identity to belong to one religion they were not interested in a plurality of religions but in one religion in one state and secondly that it will enhance the uh, monopoly of uh, secular authority or civil authority in the state three that it will help uh humanization religion in the disciplining of the subjects of the state so these were the three benefits they envisaged in entrusting the uh, power to the civil authority and uh, although the earlier concept of um, spiritual hierarchy uh, gradually uh, faded away because the the secular authority uh, after the doctrine of sovereignty uh, which was developed first of all in france uh, john bodden who wrote a book on sovereignty uh, that in the uh, secular affairs the civil authority must remain supreme and that the religious authority should be confined to religious matters family law and uh, to some extent uh, religious education uh, in the uh, more, more recent times uh, there are other two theories of secularization uh, one is the demand theory this is according to um, pipa norris and ronald engelhart who have written a book uh, sacred and secular uh, religion and politics in the world and uh, according to them uh, the first theory is what is called rationalization theory they are of the view that after enlightenment uh, which encourages rationality Uh, and the empirical uh, standards of proof 
uh, knowledge of science for uh, natural phenomena, understanding natural phenomena, and uh, so and technology, etc. And uh, Max Weber, a German sociologist, in fact said that mystery had to be conquered by reason. So this is the rationalist theory of secularization, that instead of religious beliefs and what they call theological superstitions, uh, science will be used uh, to uh, determine uh, natural phenomena. Uh, the other theory, the other they have produced is what is called demand theory, uh, which uh, presupposes that demand for religion is constant among the people, that it is not affected by any changes in technology, science, or rationality, etc. And the other theory is the uh, theory of supply side religion, uh, which believes that the demand for religion is constant, but that the supply will determine whether legion grows or declines. So according to this theory, uh, the idea is that if you build a church, people will come. So they believe that uh, activities of religious leaders and organizations can lead to uh, greater religiosity among the people. I think uh, most important aspect in my view, apart from these theories, has been the effect of the rise of um, civil republican democratic regimes in the world. And in that case, the most important case has been that of the United States, uh, where uh, what uh, uh, John Cohen, uh, professor of political theory at Columbia University in her book, uh, Religion, Secularism and Constitutional, in Constitutional Democracy. Uh, she says that uh, the American constitution has combined two principles. One, freedom of religion, uh, cons uh, given a constitutional protection uh, under first amendment of the constitution, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. So uh, to uh, allow religious freedom, uh, that is the freedom to choose one's religion or religious belief, religious organization, religious practice is constitutionally protected. On the other hand, uh, the establishment of an official religion is also prohibited. That means the state will have no official religion. Official religion means uh, that the state recognizes, accommodates, aids a religion. Uh, in terms of giving it uh, some exemptions from operation of certain laws, uh, sometimes some public funding, uh, etc. And uh, so that is also not permitted. So the uh, American Constitution uh, provides both for freedom of religion as well as uh, no. Uh, official connection between the state and religion. Both things are provided there. Now this situation uh, has not been found uh, too satisfactory either by the pol political religionists or what is called militant secularists. Both of them want to extend their sphere of presence and influence. Uh, the policy towards religion in any country is decided by the state policies and laws 
and by the decisions of the courts uh, in the American context, the Supreme Court and the courts in the states. Uh, so according to the secularists, the religious uh, organizations and leaders have been trying to secure for their religions uh, recognition, uh, aid, uh, exemption from operation of certain laws. For instance, in 1912, the Supreme Court decided that religious organizations uh, in their enterprises or businesses, labor laws uh, as they apply to other businesses will not apply. For instance, the right to collective bargaining, etc. cetera. Um, similarly, I think recently, uh, the state has been allowed to provide fund to religious schools, which was till then uh, not permitted under the law. Uh, on the, uh, so therefore, uh, this is a constant uh, struggle on both sides, the religious leaders and the secularists uh, to, and the uh, consequences, whether uh, there will be greater connection between state and religion or not, uh, will depend on the state policies as well as the uh, court uh, rulings on the subject. The, uh, <clears throat> the uh, legal position uh, remains in constitutional democracies, uh, what is called a minimum democratic uh, uh, prerequisite for relations between state and religion. And this is what uh, John Cohen has stated in her book, that there are four main uh, prerequisites for uh, a constitutional democracy to have for a democratic minimum. One, that the state's jurisdiction is superior and more comprehensive that it prevails and takes precedence over the religious jurisdiction, that it can regulate religious organization, religious practice uh, in the interest of public order and uh, security of the state. Uh, and that the state, uh, that the freedom of religion is limited by the state, but the state is also limited by the guarantee of freedom of religion. Uh, but the seculars say that the freedom of religion should also include freedom from religion, freedom to exit from a religion, uh, freedom to not believe in religion, etc. And uh, so this is uh, the first prerequisite uh, of democratic minimum. That means the state's jurisdiction is more comprehensive in the sense that it also includes um, regulation of religious activities if needed. Uh, secondly, that it is superior to the religious jurisdiction. Second principle is legitimacy of the state. And there it says that the legitimacy of the state, unlike in the past, which depended on the religious authorities, uh, depends on the consent of the people, the concept of what is called popular sovereignty, uh, that the state derives its authority from the consent of the people. As, as we will see on November 3rd, election of the president, and also uh, that uh, it is not derived from any divine mandate or decree uh, for the, like the divine right of kings in earlier times. Uh, third prerequisite is the justification. The uh, justification uh, is a concept that a state 
uh, is uh, obligated to justify by reasoning uh, the, its policies and uh, laws which affect the citizens of the state or different sections of it and that it should uh, explain to them in a language uh, which they can understand and uh, which can justify the laws and policies of the state to its citizens. And the fourth minimum, she says, is uh, civic responsibility, uh, which is a concept which holds that the ultimate accountability or answerability of the state uh, for the welfare of its people and for justice among the people is the is of the, remains with the state and cannot be delegated to anybody else. Uh, even though the provision of certain um, public goods can be entrusted to non-state actors or even religious ones, but the state will have to set up the standards of the delivery of their service and also ensure that the service is delivered in a fair, non-discriminatory, impartial manner. Uh, so these are the four prerequisites for a constitutional democracy. Uh, but uh, we can supplement them by a few others uh, like periodic fair impartial elections uh, to independent judiciary. I mean, fifth, that was fifth, sixth independent judiciary, seventh rule of law, eighth independent media, and nine, a strong civil society. And uh, as we have seen uh, in the recent time, the rise of populist authoritarian leaders in some of the countries has made it clear how fragile and delicate uh, democratic institutions are. And therefore it will require constant vigilance and nurturing of the democratic systems uh, or uh, democratic uh, states uh, in most countries of the world. And for uh, doing that, I think most important thing uh, apart from education, etc., cetera, uh, is the uh, check on the exercise of the powers of the state through legislative oversight, like the Congress in the United States, uh, through independent media, uh, through an independent judiciary, through the power of judicial review, and a strong civil society. NGOs, universities, uh, clubs, associations, etc. All those are needed uh, to maintain. I think uh, in 1953, um, Kenneth Galbraith uh, wrote a book, American Capitalism, in which he said that the balance between institutions of the state and institutions of civil society has to be maintained to ensure uh, the survival and growth of democracy in a country. So I think that uh, is very important. Now the, uh, uh, we will discuss the uh, uh, concept of multicultural democracy. Uh, you might remember the book written by uh, Samuel Huntington in 1996, Clash of Civilizations, uh, uh, where he uh, propounded the theory uh, that the future conflict will occur not among social classes or over territory, but it will occur between the fault lines of main civilizations of the world and which he enumerated as eight of them. And uh, <clears throat> so multicultural uh, culture, as you know, is a very comprehensive term, which includes language, history, customs, religion is a very important part of it. 
and uh, therefore uh, the uh, secularism in a monocultural and a multi multicultural society uh, will differ uh, in his article uh, european secularism is not secular secular enough rajiv bhargav a professor uh, at the center for developing countries in new delhi he is of the opinion that the secularism as practiced in european countries is not very sensitive to non christian religions and he makes the point that this is because of the fact that these countries and societies had earlier only christianity as the religion uh, majority religion predominantly and that migration and globalization has changed that situation and now some other uh, people of other religions have also settled in these countries and uh, he uh, devises a method of measuring uh, the relationship between the state and religion he divides that at three levels one the level of ends that are the objectives and there he says in a theocracy the other is the level of institutions second personal and third uh, the uh policies and laws these are three uh, uh, items under which he wants to uh, assess uh, the degree of secularization or otherwise of a state so the uh, he says he divides also in three types of uh, regimes first theocracy like for instance iran today they are the connection between the state and religion is at all the three ends ends institutions and personnel as well as laws and policies the other is the those states with have an established religion there the connection will be at the level of ends but not at the level of institutions uh, and personnel and uh, at the level of uh, policies and persons there can be consultation uh, at that level and last the secular state that will be disconnection at all the three levels uh, so uh, and he also says that there does not have to be necessarily a wall of separation between the state and religion and he gives the example of india Uh, where the government maintains contact with the religion and religious leaders uh, and if necessary mediates uh, any disputes among them uh, but does so based on principles of um, uh, civil uh, governing principles not on religious principles for instance he gives an example if there is a minority religious community uh, whose uh, educational health standards are uh, lower than the other and it is the policy of affirmative action of the state uh, to improve their conditions uh, then the state can do so and uh, but it does not amount to any uh, religious uh, preference because it happens that the minority religions interest coincide with the public policy interests of the state in this particular instance uh so i think uh, this is a good idea uh but uh, there is a, also an article uh, by tariq modud on secularism and uh, state and uh, he is of the view that the key factor about secularism is that this secular authority does not depend on the religious authority nor is it dominated by it he says that is the crux of secularism but he says how it can be ensured uh, 
um, there can be various ways. What he called moderate secularism has no objection to connections between the state and religion. And in this case, he gives the example of the British system where the queen is head of the Anglican church, where there are 26 bishops as members of the House of Lords, uh, where the uh, king or queen is anointed by the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, that is the highest um, uh, clergy, uh, clerical office. And, uh, but he says still it is a very secular state. This is the point he makes. Uh, he uh, says, however, that there are certain states which are very strict. For instance, the French uh, system, uh, where uh, they uh, do not want any role for the religion in any public space or uh, uh, even in the uh, any dress uh, of a type which indicates the religion of a person, etc. And I don't know whether you read it recently, uh, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, issued a statement uh, saying that we want uh, French uh, and Islam of France. What he meant to say is that a uh, non-radical Islam in France uh, because they have been having problems of some uh, activities, radical activities, including some terrorist attacks there. And uh, he has suggested in that talk that uh, France would prohibit or closely scrutinize uh, homeschooling of children. Uh, two, it will prohibit the import of imams from abroad. Uh, the Muslim clerics who are engaged for teaching uh, Muslims in France, which has been going on for a number of years. He says they will prohibit that because they bring radical ideas and uh, uh, which is not desirable. And the other thing he says is that uh, if there is any aid to uh, Islamic uh, uh, schools or institutions, uh, they will have to sign a charter uh, that they will not spread any radical uh, Islamic views. And uh, so, and he says that uh, we also admit our responsibility, that is the responsibility of the French government in terms, he says that uh, we uh, allowed uh, these immigrants from abroad to come and settle in poorer parts of the cities and which led almost to ghettoization of uh, those cities. And he says that uh, there they had no uh, opportunity for employment, public transportation, etc. And this has led to ghettoization and separatism and non-integration of these migrant communities into the mainstream uh, culture of France. I think uh, he also said that he will introduce a bill uh, toward the end of the year in December, uh, translating his ideas into laws of the country. Uh, so the uh, uh, this uh, concern and relationship uh, between secularism and religion, I think, will continue to be a bit tense, and it has been so historically also. Uh, for instance, in uh, most Muslim countries there was a tension between the uh, religious leaders called ulema or mullahs and the rulers. Uh, the Ottoman Empire worked out some solution. In Saudi Arabia, uh, there was an agreement between the uh, uh, Islamic leaders, mullahs, and the Saudi uh, ruling house uh, about an arrangement in which 
the ulema or mullahs will provide legitimacy to the saudi rule and the saudis will protect the ulema uh, but saudi arabia has uh, been having a rather harsh version of islam and which it has been propagating uh, to the rest of the world as well and uh, especially among the poorer countries uh, and uh, that is i think still going on uh, the uh, the uh, secularization theory also postulated that with the uh, increasing development modernization industrial society post industrial society etc that the uh participation in the religion religious values and uh, this will decline uh because uh of uh, people's uh, more rational understanding of the world etc that was the uh, view uh, but on the other hand and many sociologists held this opinion including auguste comte herbert spencer emil durkheim etc and uh, but now on the other hand from the first decade of the 21st century there has been criticism of this theory um, they say that uh, religiosity is vital and healthy in the united states uh church attendance etc is strong and that this is not happening and therefore um uh, that religion will remain strong and vital and not likely to uh, be weakened uh, there is another theory which this uh, pipa norris and uh, ronald inglehart have put forward and that is the theory of what they call existential security uh, what this concept means is that uh, there is greater religion in poorer sections of poor societies what they mean is that in societies where is the risk physical societal and um, uh, personal Uh, of safety of life and uh, there people take more to religion for what he calls religious reassurance that means people who feel more vulnerable uh, will become more religious according to this uh, theory although i don't think that is true in the sense that america is not a poor country and uh, so many people are religious and also in many other countries of the world uh, who are affluent uh, but th that that is one theory they have put forward in their book and they have given quite a stress to it that i think the religion is concerned about finding the ultimate reality that there is a world beyond the observable world of science and that uh, what is the ultimate ultimate meaning of life what is the ultimate principle how can one find uh, uh, lasting peace and happiness what happens after death um, and other religious belief like uh, salvation heaven etc uh, so it is not merely a question of fear Uh, many other people have also explained that religion came into existence because of fear of natural phenomena etc but i don't think that is the case uh, uh, fear in any case is always there in one's life fear of disease fear of disaster natural disasters man made disasters etc uh, so that, that that is not the reason uh, that religion is there i think with that i will uh, 
stop and invite questions. Okay, everyone, I mentioned, um, it looks like Mr. Kishan got done a little bit earlier. So I did um, ask if you have any questions to please list them uh, using the chat feature and we will uh, take turns getting them answered for you. So um, please, you may begin um, listing your questions and I will get them answered. Any questions? <laughs> Any of my, F oh, here looks like we have one here from Dr. Scorza. Can we discuss some specific contemporary issues? For example, how should a democratic, democratic sorry, government handle re religious ob observances during a pandemic? Rom, do you yeah. have do you have an answer for that? Well, I can give some uh, my views on the subject. Uh, you know, this handling of the pandemic uh, has been so difficult and also controversial in many parts of the world. Uh, one, it is inherently difficult to control this uh, virus as it is coronavirus or COVID-19. Uh, two, uh, the whatever steps people have taken have been either too much or fallen short of the needs of the situation. Uh, complete lockdown, some countries did to begin with, and then they relaxed it uh, quickly. So it re-emerged. Now, for instance, Europe, the resurgence of the virus, even here it is increasing. And uh, this has also increased the uh, powers of the governing authorities everywhere. I mean, they order the society completely, uh, close businesses, close gyms, close um, this, that, university also online now. Uh, so um, uh, the... Uh, authority even in democratic countries of the rulers has extended almost to the level of authoritarian leaders in this instance. And uh, in federal systems, there has been difference of opinion between the state governments and the federal governments, like between the governors and the president here in the United States. And uh, as far as the religious aspect of it is concerned, I think uh, uh, the religious leaders have not been much involved in the, uh, in the handling of the virus. Thank you for answering that. Anybody else, any other questions? Rob, I know you mentioned that you have done a lot of reading during this pandemic. Yeah. Do you have, um, especially on this topic, do you have any um, literature or books that you can recommend based on the topics that you have discussed? I was thinking last time I was asked about spiritualism. Spiritualism, okay. So I would like to say a few words on that now. Okay. Uh, slightly different from what I said at that time. Uh, spiritualism, in my view, is the essence of all the regions of the world. Uh, spiritualism means that which is concerned with the spirit. Uh, for instance, uh, Jesus Christ was asked 
how do you worship god by a lady and he replied god is a spirit and should be worshiped as a spirit and uh, i told this to um, peter wooly a uh, friend of mine and he said uh, can you send me the reference to it in the bible and and i did send it to him uh, so the uh, main thing in religion is spirituality anyway the rituals uh, the um, other dimensions of religion church attend attendance this that are i think secondary to the main aspect of spiritualism and uh, for instance jesus christ also said martha you are distracted by too many things there is need of only one thing now i would recite here one mantra of the vedas about spirituality aksharam pradhanam aksharam amritam hare i will translate Uh, line by line that the material nature is perishable and changeable and that the supreme divine entity infinite supreme divine entity is imperishable and immutable then the next line sharam atmanau ishate deve kah that that supreme infinite divine entity rules over both the material nature and the embodied souls this is the next line third tasse abhidhanat my meditating contemplating on that divine entity tasse abhidhanat tat bhavat and with a sense of complete identity between your core of being which is the spirit and that universal spirit the con- the idea is that the individual spirit and the universal universal spirit are one and the same if you have a rising sun risen in the sky on a clear day and you put say 1000 uh, pots of water the sun will be reflected on all thousands of those water pots and when the water pot breaks down the reflection returns to the sun so uh, the concept is that there is no real difference the difference is created only by inability of the mind to appreciate that and then we say tat bhavat bhuyashcha that by repeated regular contemplation on this vishmaya nevarti the illusion of this world disappears that only reality remains this is the the point is that the main aspect of religion is uh, contemplation on the supreme reality and according to one's own faith whatever the religion whatever the uh, method uh, people follow uh, is all right but the point is and it needs also a moral discipline uh, it needs a pure heart and pure mind pure in the sense free from negativities like jealousy hatred Uh, biases uh, etc and also bit of detachment and uh, so uh, this is what is the most important element and there must be religious harmony in uh, all societies because all religions teach good things it is the mix of religion and politics uh, which creates difficulties even religious wars and all and it happened in the past uh, but uh, the spiritualism uh, is free from all that that is i wanted to say about spiritualism very good thank you so much for adding that um mr kishan i def i have a student um 
who actually has a very detailed question. So I'm going to unmute them and have them ask you the question if that is okay. Okay. Christopher, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. So you have a, I saw that you had a very detailed question. So I want you to personally feel free to ask uh, Mr. Kishan so he could better answer that for you. Hello, Mr. Kishan. So yeah. my question is, um, you mentioned how the United States is not a poor country, but uh, religion is still a major part of the dominant culture, of the dominant culture. Um, however, do you think there's a difference in the levels of religiosity among different social classes and social groups? For instance, can the levels of their of religiosity of a rural community compare or be the same with that of a more urban community? Um, how about the levels of religiosity in distinct ethnic groups? Um, Ashley, yes. can you repeat the main point of the question? Uh, I will just... Here, let, let me let me unmute him her again because mm. I didn't hear it too clearly Christopher would you like All to right. narrow that down a little bit better for Mr. Kishan so he can answer your, it your, your audition is better <laughs> than uh, somehow on this uh, uh, I can hear more clearly what you say than what um, yeah I ask if there's a different uh uh, in levels of religiosity among different uh, social classes or social groups. Oh, that is the question. In the in uh, the United States, uh, particularly. Yeah, I think that's a good question in the sense uh, that um, uh, the practice of religion uh, differs uh, in different sections of society depending on. Uh, the religion on the uh, uh, class or uh, composition of that group. Uh, I think generally speaking, uh, there is a uh, greater uh, religiosity among the uh, uh, people who have been exposed from childhood to religious influence. And if their parents follow a religion, children generally do as well. And uh, in those families where uh, there is no such um, practice of, by their parents, and then their interest also are not that much. Uh, the other thing is the existence of the religious leaders and uh, preachers that can make a difference uh, in certain, uh, to some extent. In fact, one view is that denominational competition uh, leads to increase in religiosity. I don't know how far that is true, but that is one of the theories uh, propounded. Uh, but United States generally is uh, uh, more religious than many other affluent countries of the world so far. That, that is the uh, empirical evidence has found that. Because world value surveys, these two writers, um, uh, this uh, Pippa Norris and Engel, uh, Engelhardt have found by surveys in 74 countries uh, that the uh, uh, religious uh, religiosity and religious practice and belief is more prevalent and uh, holding steady in the United States where it has fallen considerably in Western Europe and other countries. That is the point they make. Um, do you have another question? Do you also believe that um, education has a role in 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 sort of um, de determining the participation of a, of a people uh, in, in religion. That, yeah, education definitely has a role in this sense, but it can cut both ways. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that it, uh, it can uh, encourage religiosity. Uh, if you read say, scriptures and 
uh, commentary or books on religion and spirituality, you might be more inclined. On the other hand, if you uh, read uh, literature, uh, which says that mysticism and uh, miracles and religious things are not um, uh, validated by science or other things, uh, then uh, it could lead to agnostic or even non-belief uh, in a religion. So I think it depends on what kind of education uh, one undertakes. Thank you so much for that question. We have, it looks like we have one more, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, the next question is from Diana. What challenges do you see possibly arising in future for secular societies? I think uh, that is a very good question. Uh, in the sense uh, that the, uh, the future now is changing the societies, the economies, technologies, and um, uh, political leaders changing at a fast pace. And uh, also uh, the uh, ethnic religious conflict in many parts of the world, uh, internal, not only uh, external. For instance, Middle East, there's quite a lot, Afghanistan, um, and uh, we saw what the uh, Myanmar, Rohingyas, etc. cetera. Uh, so the challenge is that the uh, religion stays within its sphere of, for instance, uh, uh, teaching about religion, spirituality, uh, divinity, etc., and leading a moral, ethical life, etc. Uh, but if religion uh, mixes with the politics, for instance, religious parties, political parties, uh, let us say Turkey, for instance, religious party which started it it was a completely secular state uh, established by uh, Kamal in after the second world war but it has now almost become a theocratic state under the rule of uh, the present uh, president there um, so the uh, support for political parties, for instance, by religious groups, and um, those are the things to be watched, and they, they, that could be problematic. Uh, too dominant an entry of religion into politics um, is a challenge, but how to keep them from entering is not easy to uh, assure. Uh, so the main thing will be how the political leaders and religious leaders, etc., cetera, um, devise strategies to uh, prevent uh, radicalization of religion uh, participation in the uh, civil affairs of the state and society. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for your questions. It looks like we're just about the at the end of the event. I wanna thank everyone for attending. We hit some great topics today and Mr. Kashan, your presentation and discussion was very interesting. Any questions that you think of and you're interested in asking, I will include my email here in the chat and feel free to send me any of the questions that you might think of later on. Feel free to reach out to me and I can reach out to Mr. Kashan and make sure they get asked for you. And I also mm -hmm. will, um, this event is being shared. So I will be editing and doing some um, uploading to the video and it will be shared with everyone um, that had attended today. And again, Mr. Kashan, thank you for um, joining us today and along with everyone else. And I hope to see everybody soon. Thank you. Bye everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye.